Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Elko, for uh, uh, coming back despite the uh, technical difficulty. Um, thank you for the prayers. Um, and uh, we, are, we are ready to get into the word of God uh, today. Please put a one in the chat if you are ready for the word of God. Um, we're going to be doing an in-depth study uh, today on the subject of the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues. And uh, as you know, there is a lot of confusion regarding this subject. Um, what exactly is the gift of tongues? We're going to be looking at that today. We're going to be going uh, on a journey through the scriptures. I'm going to be seeing what the word of God has to say on the subject and what is actually lacking in the word of God on this subject. So with that said, let's go ahead and pray. We're gonna jump right in. Um, let's pray. I hope you are taking notes. Um, please share this link with people that you believe may need to hear this message. And uh, let's get into this. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. We ask, Lord, for your blessing as we open your word. Please, Lord, speak to us, uh, show us, truth, Lord. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. So once again, what is the biblical gift of tongues? We're going to go to the screen. We're going to go to the screen, and um, we are going to uh, begin with the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I want you to put that in the chat for me. One accord in one place. One accord in one place. The Bible says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And this is where we find uh, the gift of tongues first introduced. It is on the day of Pentecost. The disciples are gathered together in one place, and they are praying to God. The Bible says they prayed for 10 days. And at the end of that uh, period of prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out and the disciples receive the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues. Now, this is the gift that is first introduced in the New Testament. But we want to know why was this gift introduced? Why was this gift introduced? introduced? That's a very important question. If we don't know the reason that this gift was introduced, then it is very likely that we're going to misunderstand the purpose of this gift. So in order to understand why this gift was introduced, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go to the book of Genesis, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Genesis 11 and verse 1. The Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now let's pause for a second. Let's come back, uh, come back to the screen. So the Bible tells us here in Genesis 11, we don't, you know, we're not sure what we're going to read on yet. What, what, we're, what, what we're going to see, we're just looking at Genesis 11 verse 1 where it says that at this time, whatever time this was, the whole world was of one speech, one language. We might say one tongue, because the word tongue actually means language. So the whole world was of one tongue. And let's go back to the screen, verse 2, Genesis 11 and verse 2. The Bible says here, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick, 
Put that word in the chat for me, please. I need y'all to, 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 to focus on certain things. So when I say put that word in the chat or mark that word, I need you to mark that word. Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. Brick for stone. Put that word in the chat for me, please. Stone. Stone. They had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Put those words in the chat for me, please. A city and a tower <clears throat> whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, remember, the flood had just occurred in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. So here in Genesis 11, they're trying to find a way to, to avoid another catastrophe. And they're trying to build a tower that's going to reach unto heaven. So the Bible says, the Bible says in verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord God said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go, go to, let us go down, and there do what? Confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So <clears throat> we see here that, that uh, uh, the world was of one language, one tongue, and they conspire together to, to actually, as it were, if it were even possible, to try to get into heaven. We're going to build a city that reaches unto heaven. God says this is what they do. We're going to go down and we're going to confound or confuse their language. And this is the origin of multiple tongues, multiple languages. Notice what the text goes on to say in verse 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. All right. <clears throat> so we should be all be on the same page thus far. This is where multiple languages are introduced because men were all on one accord and in one place deciding to find a way to get to heaven, a way that was not ordained of God, but they wanted to find a way to get to heaven of their own works, of their own will, of their own accord. And what God does is he comes down and he confounds their languages. Now, as a result of this, the, 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 the world is divided by language. We go back to the screen. We'll see in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, the Bible says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided, divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Again, Genesis chapter 10, 31. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nation. So what I want you to note is this. After the flood, Noah has three sons, Shem, uh, Shem Japheth, and Ham. And they are divided by languages. This is after the flood occurs in Genesis chapter 11. They are divided by languages. So the lineage through which the promised seed was to come, that is Jesus, was through the lineage of Shem. And when we're talking about the lineage of Shem, we're talking specifically about the Hebrew people. Now, what does this tell us? Out of all the tongues in the world, God was only going to deal with one what? Put it in the chat for me. 
He was only going to communicate with one tongue. With one tongue. With one people. What tongue was that? Y'all can help me out here. I already gave the answer. The tongue was the Hebrew tongue or the Hebrew people. So please note that God was not going to communicate with other nations. He had chosen a very specific nation or a very specific tongue. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 19, God leads the children of Israel. We go through, through some history. The children of Israel go into captivity in Egypt. God sends Moses to deliver them. And then Moses leads them to Mount Sinai. And we read these words. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And so what we see here <clears throat> is that God draws near and interacts with the Hebrew people, meaning the Hebrew tongue. He's going to be speaking and, 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 and communicating with one specific people. In fact, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32, the Bible says, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, unto the other where there has been any such thing as this great thing is, or has been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou has heard it, and live? Or has God assayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by stretched out arms, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? So all we're simply seeing here is that God was calling one nation, one tongue, and he was going to speak through that one nation, that one tongue. Now we need to understand that God can speak in any tongue. God can speak in any language. God can speak in every language, but he was only going to speak to one people, and that was the Hebrew people. Now, what were these people? Why is God dealing with the Hebrew nation? What is he calling them for? I want you to note with me in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, where the Bible says, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God was calling Israel, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew tongue, to be a holy and peculiar nation. I hope you're following me here. We're just building a foundation that is going to help, uh, help us to understand why God gives the gift of tongues in the book of Acts. Now, not only did God call the children of Israel to be a peculiar nation or people, but he also called them to do something very interesting. In Exodus 25 and verse 8, the Bible says this. God speaking says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, let, let, let's, let's, I want you to watch this and watch this carefully. The sanctuary was the house of God. God said, I want you to build me a tower. I'm sorry. Build me a sanctuary. Because through this sanctuary, I'm going to show you, the Bible says in Psalm 77, 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. So the house of God, the sanctuary, was designed to show men, to show the Hebrews how to get 
where? Come on, y'all, put it in the chat for me. How to get where? How to get to heaven? Now remember, in Genesis chapter 11, mankind says, we're going to get to heaven. And we're going we're gonna to build the way to get to heaven. We're going to create our own path to heaven. We're going to build our own tower that we feel will get us to heaven. God says, no, 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 no. That's not the way this works. That's not how you get to heaven. And he confounds their languages. Then he chooses one language, one people, the Hebrew language, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew tongue. And he says, now, you people, I want you to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. Make me a sanctuary that I may show you the way to heaven. Now, why is God doing this? Why is God showing the Hebrews the way to heaven? Is it so that the Hebrews can be saved? Is it that God just wanted one people to get to know how to get to heaven? No, no, no. Let's go back to the screen and we're going to see, according to the book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 2, this was the plan. And many nations shall come and say, come. And let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of Lord from Jerusalem. All right. Y'all catch this? Watch this now. Listen to me carefully, guys. All nations. Give me another word for that. All nations, when I say all nations, what do I mean by that? Where did the nation start? Where did the different nationalities begin? They began at the Tower of Babel, where God confounded the language. So now in Micah 4, 2, God is saying, listen, my goal is to bring all these tongues. Yes, Lisa. <laughs> My goal is to bring all these tongues to Israel, to Jerusalem, because there, there is where the true way to heaven will be found. I'm going to use you, Israel. I'm going to use you, Hebrew Israel. I'm going to use you. I'm going to speak to you to prepare you to help save the world. So I'm only dealing with your tongue now, but the goal is all tongues, all people are going to come and see that glory, that, that salvation will be found in Jerusalem. And we understand that that salvation was, was pointing forward to Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me so far? So, so note again in, with me in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 24, this was always the goal. Listen carefully. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. Now, do y'all see a problem here? Do y'all see a problem here? Because if you're a Hebrew, if you're a Hebrew, you only speak Hebrew. <laughs> Do you catch what I, If you're a Hebrew, you most likely only speak Hebrew. So God, pray tell, how, how are you going to help us to bring all these other tongues, all these other nations, all these other languages, how are you going to, because there's a barrier. Remember what you did back in Genesis chapter 11? There's a barrier. They can't understand us. We can't understand them. So God says, my, uh, 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 Abraham, the, the descendants of Abraham, I'm going to use you. I'm going to speak to you to show you the proper thing that gets people to heaven. It's not the tower. It's the sanctuary. It's the temple. It's the plan of salvation. So I'm going to help have you build that. 
and, and, and if you are faithful, the nations are going to come to you. Now, if you're not faithful, if you're not faithful, I want you to notice what the Bible says, what God told them. Listen, if you're not faithful in what I say, watch this, Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verse 48, the Bible says this. Therefore, if you're not faithful, God said, you will serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in a hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Watch this. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the ends of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose what? A nation whose tongue thou shall not understand. Now we know that God is here foretelling of the nation Babylon. How interesting. Babel. Babel. Babylon. <laughs> the Tower of Babel, where God confounded the language and then he calls the Israelites, he calls Adam, or Abraham, I'm sorry, and he calls the Hebrew people, and he says, I'm calling you for a mission. Your mission is to reach the entire world, every nation and tongue. However, if you disobey me, I am going to send you to a nation whose tongue you don't understand. And what nation would that happen to be? Babylon. Babel on. Note what the text says, Jeremiah chapter 5, 15. Again, God speaking, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from afar, O house of Israel, save the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Again, in Isaiah 28, 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. The context of Isaiah 28 is, is, is God speaking to the children of Israel saying, because y'all are so hard of hearing, because you will not listen to me, I am going to punish you and I'm going to speak to you through a people of another tongue. People who are Gentiles, people who are not of the Hebrew tongue, I'm going to send you into a foreign land. And I'm going to speak to you with the people of another tongue. So what I want you to see here clearly is that another tongue here, is, it signifies another language that is understood by people. But it is an unknown language in that it is not understood by those who don't speak that particular language. The Babylonians did not speak in an unknown tongue. It was an unknown tongue to the Israelites. Put a one in the chat if you follow so far. It was an unknown tongue to the Israelites, but it wasn't an unknown tongue to everybody on the planet. It was an unknown tongue to those who didn't understand the language. So, so, we know what happens. We know that, 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 that Israel refused to obey God and they end up going into Babylonian captivity. Now, it is while they are there in Babylonian captivity, and, and I'm just going to go ahead. I'm not, I had these slides out to read, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to read these because I, I want to save some time here. It is in the book of Daniel chapter 9 where Daniel is praying for forgiveness of the sins of Israel. And, and in that prayer, in Daniel 9, while he's praying, the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, listen, the Lord has heard your prayer, and I'm about to explain something to you. And it is here where this, pro this time prophecy is given called the 70-week prophecy. And in this prophecy... God is basically laying out that if you start from a certain time, Daniel, 
from the, from the time a certain thing happens, you count 70 weeks, it's going to bring you to the Messiah. And what God is saying to Israel in this prophecy is, look, y'all rebelled against me, and now you're in Babylonian captivity. I'm about to forgive you. In fact, this 70-week prophecy is significant for the very fact that 70 weeks is 70 times seven. And you'll remember, let's just go to the screen very quickly. You'll remember what the Bible says in Matthew 18, 22, when Peter is asking Jesus, how often shall my enemy sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. 70 times seven, beloved, is the number of forgiveness. So in this prophecy, God is saying, listen, Israel, I'm going to forgive you for not doing, for not fulfilling the mission I've called you to fulfill. Now, I'm about to send the Messiah. I'm about to send my son. When he comes, if you reject him at the end of this 70 times seven period, if you reject him, the punishment that I delayed because I'm forgiving you is going to be meted out upon you. In fact, if you look at the last part of this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, note with me, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Notice what the Bible says. Daniel 9, 20, 26. The Bible says, uh, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. And he goes on to list the time. And then notice with me, after three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off. That means crucified. Israel was going to reject the Messiah. Now watch this. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, let's come back to the screen for a moment. I need you to remember this. What was the purpose of the city and the sanctuary? Remember, in Genesis 11, what are they trying to build? A tower and a city that reaches unto heaven. God says, no, 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 no. You don't determine how you get to heaven. You can't determine how you get to heaven. What needs, I'm, I'm going to come down, I'm going to confound your languages, and now I'm going to choose the Hebrew nation, and I'm going to show them this is how you, so we're going to build a city and a sanctuary. I'm going to instruct you the right way to get to heaven. This sanctuary, this is the path to heaven. This city, Jerusalem, it, this is where I'm going to send my son that is going to show you the way to heaven. So what does, is, what does Israel do? They begin to rebel against God and they end up in Babylonian captivity. Now God says, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm, I'm giving you another chance. But if at the end of this 70 times 7, you don't obey, you don't accept the, the, the path I have laid out for heaven, then something is going to happen. <laughs> so this 70-week prophecy brings us right up to the New Testament. It brings us to the time of Christ. It brings us to the death of Christ, just as the prophecy said. And guess what happens in the very year of the crucifixion of Christ? Can anyone tell me what happened? 50 days after Jesus is crucified. What happens 50 days, I'm sorry, after Jesus is resurrected? What happens 50 days after this? It is God literally telling his people, Remember the promise that I was giving you that all nations are going to come to you, that, that I'm going to use you to reach all nations if you will accept the sacrifice, if you will accept my son who died for you? Yes, y'all, Pentecost. On the day, come on, let hmm. listen to this, y'all. Come, come with me to the screen. Uh, y'all need to see this. Y'all need to see this. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. 
Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilean, meaning they only got one tongue? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? I need y'all to catch this. In Genesis chapter 11, all nations were one. They were all gathered together in one place. But they were gathered together to find a way to heaven that was not ordained of God. And so God confounds their languages. When y'all get together and y'all want to try, I'm going to confound your languages. I'm going to choose a nation, one tongue, and I'm going to minister through that one tongue to show them the true way to heaven. I'm going to help them build and show them this is how you get to heaven. And then I'm going to use them to bring this message to all these other nations. Why? Because God so loved, not the Hebrews, God so loved the world, the world. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that he sent his only begotten son. So now his son has been sacrificed. And in the very year, according to the prophecy, that his son is sacrificed, God says, now I'm going to equip you, Israel. Remember, these men are coming from every other nation. They are all in Jerusalem for a special feast. And God says, I'm going to pour out the spirit on you so that now you can take this message back to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Those who did not have access to this because of the language barrier on the day of Pentecost, the language barrier is broken down. Now, why have I used this? Why have I built this up like this? Because there is one verse I need you to understand. It is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which is the tongues chapter. Yes, we're going to get to the tongues chapter. But I need you to understand this because right in the middle of the tongues chapter, Paul writes this. Listen to me. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 21. In the law, it is written. So Paul is talking about the gift of tongues. And now he's about to tell us the origin, the root text for tongues. <clears throat> In the law, it is written, he says, with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people. And yet... For all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Listen to me, y'all. <clears throat> Paul is literally quoting those verses we read. I will speak unto this people with stammering lips and lips of another nation. He's literally quoting this as the basis for the gift of tongues. You see, not only was God, listen to me, not only was God saying to Israel as he poured out this spirit on the day of Pentecost, not only was he saying, I am equipping you to go take the gospel to the world if you will accept it, if you will accept the Messiah, if you will understand that this is me at work. Not only is God doing that, but what he's also doing is he's saying, listen, if y'all are not going to take this message, I am going to equip people from every other nation to do it themselves. Please put a, please put a one in the chat if you understand what's going on. Please put a one in the chat if you understand. There is a reason God pours out the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And on this day of Pentecost, the Bible says Peter gets up to preach. Now watch this. The disciples are speaking in all these different what? What are they speaking, everyone? 
different human languages. Let me, let me, let's go back to the screen because y'all need to see this. Let's go back to the screen. With angels of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Is that what the text says? Is that what the text says? With angels? With what? With men of other tongues, men of other languages, meaning, come back to the screen with me, meaning we are talking about here human languages. Paul is literally telling us God is going to pour out this supernatural gift where the receiver will be able to speak other human languages that he was not able to speak before. And the book of Acts 2 literally tells us that, hey, how are we hearing everybody in our own languages? They're speaking our language. Come with me back to the screen. I want you to see this. <clears throat> in Matthew 21, Matthew 21, Jesus says this, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it about and digged a wine press and built a tower, built a tower, built a tower, <laughs> built a tower. Put that word in the chat for me, please. Jesus is giving a parable and he's saying there was a certain householder, meaning God, who has planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press and built a tower. What is the purpose of a tower, y'all? Come on. What were they trying to build back in Genesis chapter 11? They were trying to build a tower. Th this parable, God is saying, I'm making a tower, and he, and, 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 and he led it out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time drew near for the fruit, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit thereof. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent out other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he said unto them, I will send my son. They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize upon his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of that vineyard cometh, what will he do unto the husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Jesus saith unto them, watch this. Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the stone, the stone, the stone. Let us take brick. <laughs> We're going to build something with bricks, with stones. The stone that the builder rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now I need y'all to understand this. When God is saying, I'm going to bring another nation, what he's saying is, I'm going to raise up another tongue, another people. Are y'all following this? I'm going to raise up another people that are going to do what you were supposed to do. But in order for them to do that, in order for them to take the message that you were supposed to take into the world, in order for them to do that, I've got to bless my people with this gift. I've got to bless my faithful Hebrews, the disciples, th that 120 with this gift that they can take this message. Are y'all following me? There is a reason behind this gift. And, and so it, it is so interesting because note what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. Note what Jesus said here. He said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone, one brick, <laughs> one brick 
upon another that shall not be thrown down. So come back, come back with me. Remember this? Remember in Genesis 11, they sought to build a tower. They sought to build this thing that would lead them into heaven. And what happens? God comes down because of their rebellion and the bricks and stones are, they, they, he stops the work. What happens when they reject Jesus in the gospels? He says, this temple, these stones, the work I called you to do, I'm about to throw it down. There will not be left one stone upon another. Why? Because the work I called you to do, the mission I called you to, you refused. And so now God takes a people out of the Hebrews. He takes the, those faithful people who accept him and he says, now I'm going to give you the gift of tongues and you are going to go and take this message into all the world. And now you can begin to understand why God pours out the gift of tongues. Because you see, he is tasking the early church with a mission. Remember, let's go back to the screen. Genesis chapter 11, verse three. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for what? Put the word in the chat for me. They had brick for stone and slime. That is the thing that would hold it together. They had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. So remember, the Lord comes down as they are building. Hmm. What is God doing on the day of Pentecost? He's beginning a new work. He's doing a new thing. You say, what is that new thing? He's building a new city. <laughs> you see, beloved, Malachi, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible speaking of the church says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. I need you to understand that in the New Testament times, in the New Testament dispensation, a city is being built. And this city is designed to reach unto heaven, to show people how to get to heaven. Are y'all following me? Again, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Is that up on the screen? Do you see that? All right. I think my screen may have just gone away. Can you see this on the screen? There we go. There we go. Um, there it is. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 22, but you are come unto Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. This city, beloved, this city that is symbolic of the church symbolizes the path to heaven. That's what God is building today. In fact, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, the Bible says, if any man come after me, or come to me and, and not hate father and mother, wife, children, and brethren, and sisters, he or, or his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then notice what he says next. For which of you intending to build a tower? Intending to build a tower. Let me say it once more. Intending to build a a tower, y'all. Listen. That tower that is being built is the tower that leads to the... Y'all are catching it now. Oh, the flags are changing on every slide. You get it now. You understand now. God, beloved, is interested in every nation, kindred, tongue and people and the reason he gave 
the gift of tongues was to demonstrate that the gospel is for everybody. This is why the Bible says in Psalm 1810, Psalm 1810, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. It is a tower. Yes, we are building a tower to heaven. We are building a city to heaven. But that tower, beloved, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That city, beloved, is the church. And check this out. What are the stones? <laughs> What are the stones? Notice with me 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Christ and Ephesians chapter 1 3 says this blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ you see beloved this city this city called the church and this tower which is Christ and these stones which represent the people God says I'm now going to give you the gift of tongues so you can go out into the world and gather Jamaican stones. Mexican stones. Italian stones. Y'all get the idea. Every stone, stones from every nation to build this city. that will ultimately lift us up into heavenly places. And again, this is why Ephesians chapter 2, 6 says this, that he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So that's the stone, beloved. We are the stones. What about the mortar? What's that glue that holds us together? Let me just, let me just show you. Let me just show you. I'm going to go right to Ephesians chapter 2, and I need you to see this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9, or verse, verse 22. Ver, let me go back to verse 21. Verse 21, it says, Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Watch this. In whom all fitly, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It is the Spirit that is the mortar. It is the Spirit that draws everyone together. And beloved, when the Holy Spirit poured out, was poured out through the gift of tongues upon the people, that is the thing that started bringing the bricks together. What I want you to understand, beloved, is that this is a language that people were given the gift to speak for the sole purpose of gathering stones to build, to build the city of God. Y'all want to see some powerful look. Genesis eleven eight. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. That's what happened in Genesis 11. You know what happens in the book of Acts? Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, y'all need to... <laughs> y'all need to see this. In Genesis 11... They are scattered abroad because their tongues are confounded. They can't understand each other. And so they leave off building the city. In Acts chapter 8, they are scattered abroad. They are being persecuted, but they are scattered abroad with the gift of tongues in order to preach the word 
everywhere. Everywhere. Why? Because according to John chapter 11, 52, here's what the Bible says. And not for the nation only, not for the nation only, but that, but that also he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And beloved, let me, <laughs> you need to follow this. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, they said, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What were they speaking on the day of Pentecost? What was the work of of God, notice John 6, 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that mean we might work the works of God? He answered and said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Do y'all understand this? Jesus, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples are not speaking in some mysterious language that no one knows. They are speaking the mystery of God, the work of God, meaning Jesus Christ on the cross. They are lifting up Christ on the cross. People are understanding what they are saying and accepting Christ as a result from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And beloved, now you can see the importance of Revelation chapter 14, 6, which has always been the mission of God. Listen to what it says. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, the earth, and all the fountains of waters. All right. Come on, y'all. We're, we're about to get to the crux of the message now. Because what I want you to understand is this. Some people are saying, okay, pastor, we get it. There is a gift, there is a gift that clearly points to the disciples' ability to, to speak in other languages. But what about the heavenly language? Okay, because I know that's what y'all are thinking, right? Come, come, I want you to show, I want to show you Satan's counterfeit here, okay? Y'all need to see this. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, remember what God said, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. That they may not understand one another's speech. Now, when God did this, he was doing this in order to prevent the work of them building the city, right? Building a false city. Let me ask you. Do you think Satan might want to do the same thing to stop the building of God's city? What do you think? Do you think Satan would want to confound? In other words, how can I counter this outpouring of languages? Can I in some way or another make it so that this gift is seen as something else other than what it actually is? Come, follow me. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. We're going to deal with this first, and then we're going to close off with 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to go through, we're going to, we're going to break this chapter down. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes here, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and I have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, let me just break this down very quickly, because a lot of people believe that there is, there is a thing called tongues of angels. Here's a problem with that. Every time you see an angel speak in the Bible, every time, every time you hear a prophet listening to an angel speak in the Bible or overhearing angels speak in the Bible, the prophet never says, can someone translate that for me? Because I don't understand what the angel just said. I don't speak this angel's language. We have no instance in the entire Bible, not a single verse in which angels 
are speaking and the people and, and the prophets don't understand it. God speaks, when God speaks to man, he's speaking to man. He's speaking to angels. I mean, he's speaking to man. Angels are speaking to man. And there is no, there is no like, okay, if I speak to you in this language, then you'll better understand it. No, 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 no. If an angel says to Daniel, an angel says to Jeremiah, or an angel says to Joshua, whatever they say, there was no need for someone to, to go, okay, well, all angels speak. And, and when Paul here is speaking, he's using what is called hyperbolic language. In other words, he's saying, look, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, I'm nothing. Though I could speak as perfectly, though I could speak the, with, with tongues of men and of angels, he's saying, though my language were as perfect as if I was an angel and have not love, I am as nothing. What I need you to understand, beloved, is that there is no special language where God says, okay, I can communicate better with you through this language. And by the way, if Satan overhears this, then we're really in trouble. Because that's kind of the concept. But you got to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. How was, how was, how was uh, Joseph praying to, G to, to God? And how, was, 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 how were the prophets talking to God in the Old Testament? Could the devil overhear and suddenly have power over them? Because no, no, guys. The devil has no power to disrupt your prayer. You can pray out loud, you can pray silent. You don't need a special language. And again, there is no instance. Let me go to 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And this is where people really get confused. So we're going to go 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to close out with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now, by the way, the word unknown here is italicized. If you have a King James Bible, you'll see it is italicized, meaning the word unknown is not in this entire chapter. So when people read an unknown tongue, they're thinking an unknown tongue to everybody. What the text is actually saying is a tongue that you don't understand because you don't speak that language. French would be an unknown tongue to me because I don't understand it. So when Paul is writing here, Paul's complaint, and by the way, 1 Corinthians 14 is a complaint. Paul is making a complaint about the way that the church in Corinth is using this gift of tongues. So he says here, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Listen to this. For no man understands him. In other words, if I'm in a church and I'm speaking French and nobody there is from France, whatever I'm saying is not benefiting the congregation because y'all don't know what I'm saying. God understands my speech, but you all don't understand because you're not, you don't speak French or Italian or whatever the language might be. This is Paul's whole argument. So he's saying, God understands you, but nobody else understands you. Now, people read this and they go, oh, so see, there's a language that men don't understand, that only God understands. Only God understands. No, that's not what the text is saying. Paul is arguing with the Corinth church. He's saying, why are you speaking? Why are you using your gift when you don't need to use your gift? Why are you using this gift in a, in, a, in a church in which no one speaks that language? What are you doing? Are you showing off? What are you doing? Come on, let's go back to the text. It says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man, nobody understands him. Why? He's speaking in the spirit, that is, under the gift of tongues. He's speaking the mysteries. He's speaking the gospel. That's what the mysteries are. It's not a mysterious language. It's not a mysterious tongue. He's speaking the mysteries of the gospel 
in a, he's showboating in a language that nobody understands because nobody there speaks that language. How do we know Paul's saying this? Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. He that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesied edifies the church. Why? I would rather you, I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except, there, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Come back with me for a moment. <clears throat> Do y'all understand what Paul is saying here? Why are you speaking? Why are you speaking Dutch when no one here understands Dutch? If you're going to use your tongue, translate it so that people can be edified. If you're going to speak this tongue, translate it so that others can edify, others can be edified. That's what Paul is saying here. That's what his argument is with the church in Corinth. Come back to the screen and let's re keep reading. Notice what, what he goes on to say. <clears throat> he says, now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesy or by doctrine. What use is it, he's saying? And even things without life give sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give an extinct, a distinct distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise, you, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. <clears throat> now, beloved, I need you to understand here. Paul is not talking about some unknown language that no one knows. Paul is talking about why are you speaking German? An example. Why are you speaking German when no one around you is going to be benefited by it? You're, ed you're, you're edifying yourself. You understand what you're saying, but nobody else understands what you're saying. Come on, keep going. Come back to the screen. Notice what it says. <clears throat> there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without, signif sig uh, without significance. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, is that what God wants in the church? People thinking that we're barbarians? Absolutely not. Paul is trying to say here, please use common sense. Even so you, if for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to edify another church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that is a language that others don't understand, pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, what is Paul saying here? Paul is not saying, I don't understand what I'm saying. He's saying what I understand is unfruitful because it's not benefiting anybody else. My understanding is unfruitful because I cannot benefit you with that understanding. You understand nothing I'm saying. Therefore, what I am saying to you, my understanding is unfruitful. You're not getting what I'm saying. So my understanding is not producing any fruit. Come back to the screen. We're almost done, y'all. We're almost done. <clears throat> my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with understanding. Meaning, I'm going to speak and I'm going to make sure that what I'm saying, others are able to understand. Now watch this. Watch this. This is the text, y'all. Else then. When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what you're saying? For verily you give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church 
I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach other also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue, meaning a language that other people don't understand. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? This is why he literally says in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit, in malice be children, but in understanding be men. Come on, y'all. Let's not be ridiculous. Come on, y'all. Let's not be childish here. Use your common sense, Corinthians. Very next verse. In the Lord is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Not with angels of other tongues, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, say the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Why is Paul here saying that tongues are a gift for them that believe, a sign for them that believe not? Okay, let me tell you why. Because them that believe not were the people who were not Hebrews. Were the people who were of other languages. So now when a person of another language realizes, hey, wait a minute. How is it that you're a Hebrew, but you're speaking my language? And you say, oh, God gave me this gift. They're like, man, I can verify it. You never went to school for this gift. Never. You mean you actually know how to speak my language without ever hit, having taken a class in my language? Never. Okay. Who is this God of yours? Who is this God of yours? That's why it was a sign for them that believe not. Now you tell me, if I stand up before somebody and I just start going, before an unbeliever, and then say, by the way, that's a heavenly language. God gave me that. What do you think the unbeliever is going to think about you? You don't have to guess. Somebody said pig Latin. <laughs> Sound like it, right? You don't have to guess. Listen to what Paul himself says. Listen to what Paul himself says. Let's go back to the screen. It says, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place and shall speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say you are, somebody said nuts, you are crazy, you are mad, you are out of your mind. Whatever this is you are doing, I don't know what it is, but I don't want any part of it. Do you see what the devil wants to do? That word for mad, it literally means to rave as a maniac, meaning you're not making any sense. Beloved, God is not the God of confusion. He's not the God of madness. He's not the God of babble. Watch this, y'all. This is amazing. In the same love chapter, it says this, charity never fails, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall what? Come on, somebody, put that word in the chat for me. Where they be tongues, they shall what? Cease. Now come back to come back. Come back to the screen with me for a moment. Why would Paul say that tongues would cease? Why would Paul say, hey, there's coming a time when tongues are not going to be needed anymore. The gift of tongues is not going to be needed anymore. Why would Paul say that? Beloved, we're living in that time now. The gospel has gone into many parts of the world where there's no longer a problem with people in a certain country having never heard the gospel. In, in the early church, that was not the case. And so God gave the gift. Now, here's something very interesting. People say, well, there are two forms of the gift. There is the language part, and then there's the heavenly language part. My question is, why is it that people 
who claim to have this gift never are never able to demonstrate that they can speak in any other language except the language that nobody can test. Did you all catch what I just said? Why do we have no instance in all the Bible of any disciple, of any individual speaking in a language that no one understood, but we have examples in the Bible of people speaking multiple language, languages under the influence of the Holy Spirit, languages that people could understand. If I were to ask you, show me one example in the Bible where someone is speaking in an unknown tongue that no one knows. <clears throat> Just one verse. I like to call it a root verse, a root text. A root text is a text upon which you can base the rest of your theory on, right? So a root text might be the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. And now we're going to build on that. I'm going to demonstrate to you why the living know that they shall die and the dead know not anything. But where in the Bible can we find any example of any individual in the Old or New Testament speaking a language that no one understood? It is absent. It is not in the Bible. And yet today, many, every person that I've ever known that claims to have the gift of tongues cannot speak in any other language unless they went to school for that language. So what is clearly revealed in the Bible, they can't do it, so there's no way to test them. But what isn't revealed, oh, you know, how, what would you say? I think I said... You see, beloved, the devil's trying to make the church look mad. The devil's trying to make Christianity look crazy. The devil's trying to make Christianity look like, look like y'all are out of your mind. And you really believe this is God? And he's taking advantage of well-meaning people. This is not, a, this is not a, a stone being cast to people who currently say, hey, I have the gift. For a lot of people, this is confirmation that they are connected with God. See, I can do this. So I, this is confirmation. That I'm, but if you study the Bible, if you because let me tell you something, the devil can provide experiences. Just, just read the Bible. <clears throat> the devil can appear as an angel of light. The devil can convince, hey, this is miraculous. The devil can do the miraculous. That's why we cannot depend upon signs like we must depend upon a thus saith the Lord. And what's interesting is this, beloved, if you go into a church where people speak in tongues and you ask two different people to interpret the same th the thing that one individual says, you will find that no interpretation matches. Come on. We're almost done. We're almost done. We're almost there. Um, <clears throat> let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to, but if prophesy, but if all prophesy and they're coming, one that believeth not, or one is un unlearned, he's convinced of all, he's judged of all. This is continuing 1 Corinthians. And thus for the secrets of his heart, we're going to skip this. We're just going to move on. We're going to move on. Listen, <clears throat> listen, <clears throat> here, simple verse here, simple understanding. If there be no interpreter, let the individual keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. You don't see this. You don't see this. It's almost as if this verse has been removed from, from many people's Bibles. Now, if you're remaining silent with this particular tongue, what sense does it make to even speak it? Did y'all catch what I just said? The text says, if there be no interpreter, keep silent and speak to yourself. You want to pray to God in French? Go ahead and pray to God in French. You want to pray to God in Spanish? Go ahead and pray to God in Spanish. But if you're praying in Spanish in a church that is, <clears throat> that is English or praying <clears throat> In English, that a church is in Spanish, just to show off that you can pray in English or pray in Spanish. Come on, y'all. Be don't do not be children in understanding. Be children in malice, but don't be children in understanding. 
Come on, a few more verses. We're going to wrap this up. I promise you. Uh, um, go back to the screen. Uh, uh, the spirit of prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. The devil seeks to bring in confusion that will stop the building up of the church, stop the building up of the city of God. And this is one of the ways in which he seeks to do it. Babylon, confusion. Revelation 14, 8 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You understand that Babylon is trying to exalt herself to heaven and Babylon, which represents a, a, a system of churches that are teaching error. Beloved, one of the most dominant errors is the error of Babel in the name of Jesus because it makes the church look crazy to unbelievers and this is what the devil is doing. So let me break this down very quickly. Why the gift of tongues? Why the gift of tongues? The Bible says again, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each one of them. Why the gift of tongues? First of all, Isaiah 6, 6 says this. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Why the gift of tongues? Because God was demonstrating that through the sacrifice of his son, he had purged his people and had purged their lips so that they could now go out and preach the gospel with power. That's why the, the, the gift came in the symbol of tongues. Why tongues of fire? Because God was signifying that, the, you're, you, that I am purifying you to go and preach the gospel. Why cloven? Come back, Matthew chapter 16, Mark 16, verse 15. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You see, a cloven tongue is divided, meaning there are parts. God is saying, I'm giving you languages that is going to be able to reach every nation, kindred, tongue, and people so that the gospel can reach into all the world. And why fire? The Bible says in Jeremiah 20, 19, 20 verse 9, then I said, I will not make mention of his name nor speak anymore in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. Beloved, the gift of tongues is simply designed. It is simply designed. It is simply designed to show that the gift of tongues was given to his people to spread the word with fire, with passion, to take it into all the world. And when the time, when the time began to come, that the gospel was going into all the world, the gift of tongues, as we understand it in the Bible, was no longer necessary. But I will show you this. This is our closing text. You see, beloved, everybody is supposed to have a tongue of fire. Everybody will have a tongue of fire. You can either have the fire of the Spirit on your tongue, not meaning necessarily that you're speaking some other language, but your tongue is set on fire because it's on fire for God. Or you can have this fire. James chapter 3, verse 5, where the Bible says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Listen to me. We're wrapping this up. You can either, your tongue can either be on fire for God or it can be on fire for the devil. I need you to understand this. Listen to me. And I see a comment in the chat, actor's box. Let me say this. If you're in a place where God feels it necessary to give you the gift of tongues so you can reach a people that don't understand you, he will give you that gift. That's a legitimate use and understanding of the gift of tongues. 
But what we see happening today, beloved, you cannot find it in the word of God. You can find it if you misapply a certain text, but you cannot find any example of any such thing happening among any of the, of the disciples, among any of the churches ever. I pray today that this message would have touched someone who needs to hear and understand this. God is not the author of confusion. It is so interesting. If you were to go into the commentaries, pre the, the commentaries before the 1800s, before the uh, late 1800s, to look at how commentators almost unanimously uh, uh, explained 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you will see that they were almost all unanimous with you know, languages, 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 languages. It was not until the modern movement that people started taking this to mean some unknown language which no one understands, including the speaker, him or herself. Beloved, we need to have the tongues of fire, and that means we need to have tongues that are set on fire for God. That's the tongue that we need now. Why? Because God has a mission for us to finish building the city, to finish building that time, to demonstrate, to show the entire world, this is the way to get to heaven. We have a work to do. We got stones to collect and we need the mortar of the spirit to bring it all together. <clears throat> you want to be a part of that work? You need to be rightly equipped with the gifts, beloved, not false gifts, not counterfeit gifts. You need to be rightly equipped with the word of God, with the spirit of Christ, and with the truth. I pray this message touched you today. If that's you, please put a one in the chat. If it's challenged you, put a one in the chat. If you feel like, man, I need to study more, I need to understand more, put that one in the chat. I'm going to ask Rick, uh, our, our, uh, I'm going to ask our team to put up our Bible workers' contact information. If you're saying today, okay, I need to study this out, and I need to really understand, I want to study with someone, and I really want to get to the, to the bottom of what truth is, please, there is our Bible workers' contact information in, in the, um, uh, on the screen. May God bless you as you continue your search for truth. And I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, please, I pray that all who hear this message, who, who are even now caught up in this, in this understanding of what tongues is, that after hearing this message, they might get a clearer picture of why you gave this gift and what the true gift of tongues is versus what is commonly understood to be the gift of tongues today. Lord, speak to your people. Bless us. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our ignorance, Lord. And may we be drawn closer to you and ultimately be drawn into heavenly places through the tower and the city you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to invite all of you watching to, if you would like to join us on Altar Live, to join our after um, uh, after discussion.